There's a cliche that says a picture is worth a thousand words. I know we hear it all the time, but really, have you ever thought about the priceless value of an image? I don't like to think that I have regrets in life, but there is one regret that I have. And to be honest with you, it sticks with me every day. And that is that I have very few photos of me and my mom together in my teenage years. I have looked and looked and there are little to no pictures of just me and my mom in the few years before she died. And I hate that. It's one of the reasons I take so many pictures of my kids. And it's one of the reasons that I say, sorry, not sorry, when I ask people to take pictures of me and my kids together. Pictures are so valuable when you've lost someone you love because it's the only physical thing you have really to remember them by where you can see them and you can feel the emotion behind that image. And today's guest realized the value of an image in the most unimaginable way possible. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just an incredible person who's trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact right where you are. My guest this week is Ashley Jones, the founder of Love Not Lost, a nonprofit organization that photographs people and their families facing a terminal diagnosis. Ashley took her own experience with loss and pain and fueled it into something that will bless families facing the worst. This is a powerful, emotional, and raw conversation. So without further ado, on to my chat with Ashley. Hey, Ashley, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Molly. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, We were introduced through a mutual friend, Bethany Tran, who it's funny because I feel like maybe almost half of the guests that I've had on the show know Bethany in some way. So Bethany's like, Hmm. she's a connector. (laughs) Um, She is. She's good at that. But I actually have followed your work even before I knew that Bethany knew you. So I am really excited to hear more of your story and how you got into um, working with Love Not Lost or starting Love Love Not Lost. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you would give us what all our guests do, and that's give us the Ashley 101. (laughs) <laughs> sure. Um, well, I'm glad that you've been following along. It's been a fun journey. Yeah. I guess I'll start with, you know, my husband and I were, you know, newly married, just graduated college, and we were pretty young and decided to, you know, start life, moved to Atlanta, lived in town, and got surprised with a pregnancy a year into our marriage. Mm. Um, so we literally had just celebrated our one year anniversary. Um, we even toasted to like no babies. Like we, we were like, Whoa, we made it a year. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> then you're like, whoops. Yeah. Cause his parents had him like, like a month after they got married or like, you know, got pregnant yeah. with him a month after they got married. And, um, so we were like, yeah, we were like, we made it, um, a whole year. And then, yeah, like two months later, we're like, Oh, Um, and it was just one of those things we were like, okay, like we'll just be young parents and it's fine and we'll make it work. Yeah. So yeah, it was just kind of a a whirlwind ended up delivering really a a beautiful process. I had a great pregnancy, natural delivery, and, um, they sent us home from the hospital and everything was great. And I was, you know, just finding my way of recovery and becoming a young mom and, um, And, you know, that transition to parenthood is, is always like, especially, you know, that first one is like crazy rocks Um, the world. (laughs) Yeah. You're just like, what did I do with my life before a child? Cause I don't know. Yeah. And it's amazing. Just like, you know, how much your life gets wrapped up in that. But anyway, so at a, a month old, I noticed something, you know, just wasn't quite right. Um, her, she wasn't moving her limbs a lot. And I was like, okay, maybe we just swaddled her too much or I don't know. And then I noticed her, her right arm came up like a chicken wing. Mm. And so I was like, oh, that doesn't look good. I'd volunteered with severely handicapped kids um, when I was in high school. And one of the little girls I worked with had cerebral palsy. And I knew, you know, it just looked kind of similar to a contracture that cerebral palsy kids have. And I was like, dang, this is not good. And so I brought it up with her doctor at the one month checkup. 
Um, he was like, yeah, it doesn't look great, but you know, it could just be an injury at birth. And I was like, Oh, she slid right out. I don't think that's it. (laughs) Um, and so I was like, you know, I'm willing to go to a specialist and, and see, but in, in the time that we got to the next specialist, her other arm was affected and had like rotated inward and just kind of like hung limp and she couldn't really move it. And so I was like, dang, like what is happening? And, you know, after that specialist, we were referred to a neurologist and it was just kind of like, again, just another whirlwind of what is happening right now. And, um, we had appointments and then, you know, my pediatrician called and was like, Hey, I got some bad news. And, you know, when you come in for your two month checkup, uh, we'll talk about it. And I was like, uh, you cannot do that to me. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, I love you. Um, like he's a great doctor. He's amazing. Um, but I was like, I will drive myself crazy if you don't tell me. Yeah. And hindsight, I should have let him drive myself crazy because my worst case scenario in my head was just like lifetime of physical therapy. Right. Um, or like surgeries or, you know, special needs. Um, and when we got on the phone call and, he said the words premature expiration. I was like, what? Like my heart just fell out of my chest. Cause that like hadn't even crossed my mind. Yeah. That like her not being able to move her arms would eventually end in her death, you know? Yeah. And I I mean, forgive me, you know, sometimes I want to like look at doctors and be like, do you really have to use terminology? I know. Like, I know it was it like necessary? the gentlest way he could say it. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I know. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was funny cause he said premature expiration. I was like, wait, what? Like you mean death? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, let's clarify this. Um, and so it was just one of those things where I was like, dang, like that sucks so bad. Um, and so I just, you know, like cried for a good long week and like, couldn't really eat or drink anything. Like, I think I sustained myself on smoothies that week and, um, and just tried to like wrestle with our reality that, you know, we would probably lose her. Um, so once we actually got to the doctor's office for the checkup, he confirmed everything and he's like, we'll do, you know, testing to make sure, but you know, we're pretty confident she's got spinal muscular atrophy. And so, and that is very similar to ALS, correct? Correct. Um, so spinal muscular atrophy is essentially ALS, but in babies. Yeah. So muscles degenerate, there's no cure and yeah, there's like very little you can do at least at the time. Yeah. So the doctors are like, yeah, pretty much like go home and love her and you're welcome to like put a a team of doctors together to help just keep her as healthy as possible throughout this time. But also know that like hospice will be your friend. And we really can't tell you how long you have with her, but a lot of babies don't make it to their first birthday. And so she was just about two months old when you received this mm-hmm. diagnosis. Yep. And, and her name was Skylar. Skylar. Mm-hmm. Right? Skylar Marie. Yeah. So, um, and it, it was, you know, just heart wrenching because yeah. you like look down at this beautiful little two month old baby who was so full of life. And you're like, how in the world can she die? Like, that's just not right. (laughs) You know, it's like, um, I mean, and and, in, in my head, logically, I know that like babies die, children die, you know, young adults die, but it's like, it doesn't really compute because it just, it's so not how it should be, you know, um, that when it actually came to, to my life as my reality, um, it, it took a, a while to really wrap my brain around that. So anyway, after wrestling with that and coming to terms with it, you know, my husband and I wanted to make the most of our time together. And we had a bunch of friends kind of fall off the face of the planet in our lives just because we were the first of all of our friends to have a baby and certainly the first of all of our friends to lose one. So there were a lot of people who just like didn't know what to do or they freaked out or they got, you know, scared and just disappeared Um, but we also had some really amazing friends who showed up to love us well. And one of those friends gifted us a portrait session. Oh, wow. And that was a really beautiful gift. So Tessa was the photographer and she showed up, uh, around when Skylar was six months old 
and capture these really beautiful photos um, that I treasure tremendously. And um, it was just a really fun experience too. Like I was, you know, a proud mom. I wanted a family photo and um, we captured some really great moments together. And then fast forward, we had kind of a crazy run in with doctors and had to call in hospice at 10 months old. But thanks to the help of a researcher out in Utah who's dedicated her career to SMA, she kind of intervened and actually doubled Skylar's life. Wow. So, yeah, Skylar ended up passing away at 21 months old. And thanks to the researcher, we got like, I mean, literally she doubled her life. It was amazing. Wow. Um, so we feel very fortunate to have had that extra time with her. Um, and Tessa, the photographer, came back for another session, um, when Skylar was around like 16 months old. So, um, so yeah, we have these beautiful portrait sessions and it was one of those things where I, I wasn't as a photographer myself, like I appreciated photography, but I wasn't really fully aware of the healing power of photos Mm -hmm. until after Skylar was gone. Yeah. So I knew the value of photos. Um, but I didn't really understand the power of them. And so, you know, when Skylar died, that first week was so painful. Like I literally turned down every single photo in our house that had her in it yeah. because it was just heart. Like it, it felt like my heart was just going to stop yeah. beating. Yeah. Like it was just so painful. But after a week or two, I just realized I really missed her and it was one of those things where I just started turning photos back up because I just wanted to stare into those really beautiful, deep blue eyes of hers. You know, yeah. it was like, man, I just want to see her face and see her smile and um, have her look back at me. And the photos allowed me to do that. Yeah. And so the other thing I realized is, you know, I'm not sure if you've had any personal grief experience, um, but when people show up to kind of support you, mm-hmm. A lot of times unknowingly and often unintentionally, they bring fear or judgment or expectation into the room with them. Yeah. So, you know, like I had some friends who would come like a a week or two after Skylar died and they'd be you could tell they were like unsure of what to expect. Like, you know, is she going to be a puddle of tears or is she going to be okay? or, you know, and then there's like do I say her name? Do I not say her name? Like, do I talk about this? Or, you know, there's just all this stuff that people bring into the room when they come to support someone. But the photos didn't have that. The photos allowed me to grieve however I needed to grieve. And so I could hold them and ugly cry and have snot literally pouring out of my face (laughs) and not worry about if my friend thought I was disgusting or not. (laughs) You know, it's like, okay, like I don't have to worry about anything. I can just be whatever I need to be. Um, yeah. and I could sit with the photos and talk to her and not worry if people thought I was losing my mind, yeah. you know, or think I'm a crazy person. Yeah. So I just realized, um, that photos were such a huge gift with, with healing, um, and grieving and you have to grieve to heal that it was really powerful. And I wanted to give that gift to other people. So I started volunteering sessions anytime I heard of anyone facing a terminal diagnosis. Yeah. And, uh, on our website and, and a lot of our printed material, you'll see the Hill family, And they're the family in front of the big hope letters. Mm -hmm. So they were the first family that I met after Skylar died that were facing a terminal diagnosis. And the dad had stage four melanoma cancer Mm. and they had two little kids and the mom was super sweet. Her name was Rachel. And I offered to do a session. They took me up on it and we captured three different sessions with him. And I unknowingly captured his last day on earth. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I was actually there when he, when he died, um, They flew me out to L.A. to capture their Christmas together as a family. And he passed away on Christmas Eve morning. Wow. And so, yeah, it was just like, but again, it's like I I saw how the photos brought them comfort and brought them healing. And I ended up putting a book together for their family. And it's been really cool. Um, So I put a book together of the highlights from the sessions that we did for their family. And, um you know, a couple months later, Rachel called me and was like, you know, our daughter, Evie, anytime anyone new comes to the house, she'll grab them by the hand and walk them into the living room and open up the book and introduce them to her daddy. And she's like, so proud of, of who he is. And she'll tell them the story. Yeah. And I was like, dang, that's so cool. Like, 
and really powerful that this these photos allow this little girl to continue a relationship with her daddy and be so proud of of their family. Yeah. Um, and then a, a year or two later, Rachel called and let me know that she actually sent the book on tour. So the book is actually traveling around California right now with all of his friends and family. Oh, wow. And each each person's getting to spend time with it before sending it back to Rachel. Um, so it's, it's been really cool because it's, you never know, you know, when I take photos, I, I always have the intention of celebrating life with people and preserving their memories in the hopes that it would support them in grief, but, and, and bring them comfort and, and joy and those things. But you never know like the, the level of impact and the, the level of reach it has either. Yeah. Um, so it's been really neat to, you know, as we've done more and more sessions to hear those kind of stories coming back, um, which is a really beautiful thing. Wow. So what year did you officially start Love Not Lost? Yeah. So Love Not Lost started in officially launched in 2016. That's so um, Skylar died in 2011. Yeah. And I had volunteered sessions the the next like several years. Yeah. And then um, I had the idea for it in 2015. And and then it was like, OK, well, if we're putting together like this idea of, OK, if I'm going to do a nonprofit, like I, I, I want to create something that will help people on a national level. Mm-hmm. Like that's always been my vision to make sure we can help as many people as possible. You know, how can we start? something responsibly and grow it responsibly as well. Yeah. Um, and so it was, um, November 19th is Skylar's birthday Mm -hmm. and it was November 19th of 2015. And up until then, like her birthday had been like a pretty depressing time for me. Like I would usually just find myself alone eating brownies by myself Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) or like whatever. Um, but this was, the first year that I actually invited, um, probably like 30 of our closest friends and family over to my friend's house to throw a birthday party for her. Mm. And I, you know, I told everybody like, look, you know, um, I have a vision I want to share with you and it's an honor of Skylar's birthday. She would be six this year. And so, you know, my goal is to raise $6,000 to help me carry this new vision forward and, and birth this new idea into the world. Yeah. And so that for me was a way to like really honor Skylar's birthday um, and honor this new idea that came, you know, from our journey with her, uh, which has been a, an amazing thing because now every year on November 19th, it's no longer a depressing day. It's the day my second child was born, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's been pretty cool. So we, we had, we raised $6,000 that night. Um, that got us the promo video that you see on the website. And I have enough, um, my backgrounds in graphic design and communications. And so, um, I had done, print design and web design and all of that. So I actually put together our website and launched it the 1st of January with the promo video. Wow. You Um, got right to it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't waste time. I get things done. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, so we launched January 1st and had our first applicant within the first month and, um, and then, you know, hit the ground running. That is absolutely incredible. Um, well, I, I honestly don't remember how I first came across the work that you do and, um, and your story, um, along with Skylar's story. I don't remember how, um, but Mm -hmm. I just remember when I came across it, I just said, man, this is what a gift this is. Um, and you mentioned earlier, or you, you said something earlier in the show, like, I don't know what your personal experience with grief is. Mm -hmm. Um, so my, my mom died when I was a senior in high school. Um, Mm. and one of, and this is something I talk about all the time is like one of my biggest regrets that I cannot fix is I have almost no pictures with her Mm. from my teenage years. Um, I have found maybe two or three, um, and they're not good. And they're, you know what I mean? Like they're just not great pictures. Um, I like, I think the earliest, so she, I was 17 when she died, the the most recent picture I can find of just the two of us, I'm maybe like 14. Mm. Um, and I hate that. 
I hate yeah. it. And um, I do photography on the side. Um, I, you know, and sometimes like people, you know, especially my family will kind of like roll their eyes at my like insistence <laughs> at taking pictures of me and my family or like when I'm like, please take a picture with me at the kids. And I'm just like, I know yeah. that you might just think that I'm being a silly blogger or something like that. But no, that's <laughs> not why I do it. I do it because I know, God yeah. forbid, something were to happen to me. I don't want my kids to grow up or I don't want right. to, you know, God forbid something happened to my husband or my kids. Like right. I want pictures to, I want those memories. Um, yeah. And then, you know, uh, and then this year, um, obviously it is, it does not even come close to um, losing a child, but uh, we lost two babies in the second trimester um, mm. of pregnancy this year. And I'm so um, sorry. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a picture that I have on that I took on Mother's Day. Um, this is I was actually pregnant at the time with the um, our second son Malachi that we lost in June, um, and mm-hmm. we had lost our son Elijah in February. And I asked my husband to take a picture of me, and it was like we didn't have shoes on, like I didn't have makeup mm-hmm. on. It was just like sitting on the front porch, and it's a picture of like me and both my kids, and we're holding Elijah's urn. And, um, mm. and it's just taken with a cell phone, but that picture means so much to me because I know that yeah. I was pregnant at that time. And then mm-hmm. when we were at the beach, um, a month later I was showing, I was, I mean, I was in my second trimester and I, you know, my body yeah. had never even really recovered from the first right. one. Um, and so I was showing pretty, pretty heavily and so there's like a picture of me on the beach with like looking very pregnant with both Lily and Amos, like my, mm. um, my children now. And, um, and like that picture was taken just a couple days before we found out that we had lost Uh, Malachi. And so like, as still, you know, and I remember in that moment on that beach, I mean, obviously we didn't know that we'd lost the baby, but like the kids are melting down. Everybody's like, (laughs) we want to go back to the house. And I'm like, please, like just, uh, this means so much to me. This is the one thing that I want is like, just someone take a picture of me with these kids, with these kids and take a picture of our family. Like it's all I want. Um, and that's why is just because that those pictures are mm-hmm. healing. And like, I know yeah. how sometimes I just yearn to go back and like, look at pictures of my mom. And, um, you know, I'll sometimes, you know, here, well, gosh, we just had the gosh, she died in 2002, it was 16 years in November that she died. And mm-hmm. I still find myself like, wanting to go through old pictures of her. And I just want to hear her voice and I want to see her face and I want to he- hear her laugh and those things. And those yeah. memories are crucial. And you don't realize for people that haven't experienced, gr- you know, a great loss like that of a parent or of a child or a sibling or a best friend, like you don't realize how much you need those things. Um, yeah. So what a gift you are giving to families who are going through just the unimaginable yeah, and I don't, I don't know if you've felt this way too with, you know, you've had a lot of time that has passed as well. Um, for me, one thing that I just get so frustrated by is that I can't control um, or I haven't figured out a way to do it yet. <laughs> um, I can't control like which memories stay in my brain and which mm-hmm. memories leave. Yep, yep. And so there are memories that I know I'm losing of Skylar and it kills me it's awful that, yeah, it's like, man, like, and as more time passes, I know it's just going to get worse um, because she's not here and it's not like, you know, things aren't being triggered. But mm-hmm. I think the, the other thing that I discovered about photos, which is just, again, just a, another layer of beauty um, to the gift that they bring is it's like an external hard drive for your brain. Yeah. Because you can look at the photos and even though you may have like completely forgotten about that day, you look at the photos and then all of a sudden you're taken back there and you're like, oh, I kind of remember that. And then that day so-and-so came over and then, you know, like this happened. And then it's like, oh yeah, that memory was there, but I just couldn't pull it out, you know? Oh, I've definitely had that. I was just a couple months ago, I was going through, I found, I mean, I still have, embarrassingly like 16 years later I still have bins of my mom's stuff that I just has just sat um because I just Mm -hmm. couldn't go through it and a couple months ago I was like okay I've got these three bins here here is my goal like my goal is to 
to get them all down to one bin. Like, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, let me just get rid yeah. of the stuff that is actual, actually just junk. And then anything else, you know, I can deal with later. And mm-hmm. as I was going through these bins that where a lot of it was just junk, like papers that my mom, my mom was just one of those people who never got rid of anything. She saved everything. Like I found, mm-hmm. she still had, oh, this is a funny story. She still <laughs> had my teeth, like my baby <laughs> teeth. And I was like, really? Like why? Why? Oh, Why? My mom, my mom, I'm, I can <laughs> totally relate to that because I was in, I think I was like middle school or high school. And my mom came out of the back closet with this little box and she was like, you're never going to believe what's in here. And she was like excited to show me. Yeah. I'm and a- she opens it up and I'm not even kidding you. This like kind of makes me gag. <laughs> <laughs> she like opens the box and it is literally a scab from my head that happened at birth oh my goodness that is and it had little hairs attached to it still and everything and I, I like I was like mom that is the grossest like, thing why? you've ever done ever I like saved why some... do you still have that so... I save weird things in my kids but at the same time I'm like I'm not saving their teeth like I'm not yeah no. she had she had two teeth in there yeah. she had the wow. scab and then she had like a little locket of hair or something I'm like <laughs> why do you need the locket of hair when the hair is attached to the scab <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that was nasty yeah. it was like oh man the things we do as parents it's really true uh but then but anyways but my point being is that like while I was going through that bin like I found this photo album from gosh I was probably seven or eight and it was a camping trip we had taken to Hershey Park in Hershey Pennsylvania oh fun I and, was just there for a wedding yeah last and weekend. I, I it was just like oh I remember this trip and then I was remembering like all of a sudden all those memories just started flooding back of like riding I don't remember what what that ride is called where you like drive through the chocolate it's like a chocolate tunnel and you know oh, cool. and I just remember my mom like getting off the ride and getting Reese's um like her, the Reese's peanut butter cups that would just freshly been made and mm-hmm. and her talking about how the whole city smelled like chocolate and like the, all of those memories started flooding back and I That's just awesome. it just reminded me of yeah the power of an image and the power of um of, of capturing something like that and what that can do for your brain and and yeah I love the way you said that's just the healing power of images mm-hmm. it, right. it is so true so um I yeah, I just I, I can't tell you enough um, how much I admire what you're doing and, and what a gift Thank to you. other families uh, to be able to serve them in that way and something that is coming out of a place of such pain, um, mm-hmm. but then also such hope and joy. And you are carrying on Skylar's memory in just such an um, incredible way. And um, and I also I have to say this, too, as well, is when you talked about how when people come over to support <laughs> after mm-hmm. grief uh yeah people they, they don't know what they're walking into um mm-hmm. and so you're also you know in some ways you can help educate the support system of people mm-hmm. through the work that you do and um I mean even just through losing two babies in pregnancy I always tell people yes. like, say their names like yeah I, you know the and for me since since they died in utero like all I have is my the the memories that I have of them in my belly and like feeling, feeling them, feeling mm-hmm. them. And I have their names and then I have their mm-hmm. ashes in my house. That's all I have. Like, mm-hmm. so so, you know, to acknowledge like somebody's child and continuing to say their name, and especially like I've talked to other moms through this process who have lost um children at birth or or infants or um young, 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 young children. And they always say all the time, it's just like people who don't understand will say like, well, I don't want to maybe like bring up that pain. I'm like, right. Here's the thing. It's already there. (laughs) It's already there. And I'm just like, for those that are listening, that maybe you have a friend who has lost a baby um, at, at during pregnancy, after pregnancy, a young child um, by bringing up their child and saying their name and asking about them, you are not causing further pain because I guarantee you they are already thinking about that child. It, mm-hmm. Whether they're like doing something else, the thought of their child is always just beneath the surface. Um, and sometimes, and if for a parent that has lost a child, and I've heard this as well, like if, if you ask about them, they'll they'll say they'll let you know if they're not in a place to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, 
for the the opportunity, I mean, I feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but for the most part, every parent I've talked to that has lost a child just says the opportunity to tell a story about their child or share a memory or maybe share an image that they haven't shared on social media before or, you know what I mean? Like the yeah. opportunity to do that is a gift. It's a gift. Yeah, and I think it gives, I think it gives parents a sense of normalcy too, because it's like, oh, I, like you know, every other parent just dotes on their kids and brags about stories and shows pictures and stuff. But like when you lose a child, all of a sudden that's like, you're kind of just expected to like put it in the closet, you know? Yeah. And it's like, no, like my child existed and she was like this beautiful girl who was so full of life and wisdom. And even in her infancy like people would come over and be like oh my gosh like she's such an old soul like look at her eyes they're just so full of wisdom and you know like everyone is so moved by her um and so for for me to try and you know tuck that back into a section of my brain and and then push all of her memories in the closet it's like that's that's actually more painful than not talking about her yeah you know it's like Um, so I think for me and, and, you know, I get it, it's awkward. Like, so, so I mentioned, you know, we had a bunch of friends who disappeared and, and, you know, what was sad was like over the first couple years of love, not lost, like every family that I photographed, I would hear really similar stories of how all these people felt alone and abandoned by their friends because they just stopped coming around or they stopped showing up or they just disappeared and, And it's like, okay, so what's going on? And then I would, you know, I would, I would wonder like, okay, did these people actually care or they just, they're not capable or or what's the deal? But then I, I did a bunch of speaking engagements and, you know, podcasts like this. And, um, and every time I get people who message me or come up and talk to me afterwards who are like, oh my gosh, like I just had a coworker who lost a baby. Like, what do I do? Or my friend just lost their mom. Like, how do I support them? Or all these things. And I'm like, you're asking a complete stranger, like how to support your friend. (laughs) I like, I get it because I've been through grief and there is that level of personal, you know, like there's the the level of personal experience, but also like, you know, your friend, hopefully way better than I do, you know, like you should know what they need or what they're, you know, like, I don't know if they have a dog or if they have kids, like you could take their dog for a walk or take their kids for a weekend or, you know, like, whatever, like, hopefully, you know, what their needs are, if you stop and think about it. Because you just think of them as a normal human, who just needs a little bit of extra support. You know, it's like, they didn't turn into an alien all of a sudden, like, you know, we can still show up and love them well. Um, And I think people get so nervous and afraid. And it's like, wait a minute, like, if you, if you show up genuinely in love, like wanting to love your friend or love your family member. There's, I really have struggled to think of a situation where you would be so hurtful and offensive that you would need to be afraid. Yeah. Like if you are, if your genuine motive is to show up and love that person, I, I don't think there's any, any reason to be afraid. Yeah. And so I think what gets people is that, they feel like they, you know, like, oh, if I'm, if I'm obligated to show up for someone or, you know, if I'm trying to show up for someone just to look better or whatever the, the other motive would be outside of love, um, you know, then I think that, um, that, that shows through and that's when, you know, you might say something offensive or you might, um, get afraid and then fear speaks instead of love. Yeah. And so, you know, I think over and over again, I just tell people like, don't be afraid, just show up and love them. Yeah, I completely and, agree. Yeah. And so that's something I, and I know it's hard, like it's, it's scary. It, it requires vulnerability and courage to do it. Yep. But I think, you know, one of the things with Love Not Lost, because we heard, you know, we just saw that disconnect of like, there are all these people who love and care for their, their friends and family, and they don't know what to do. And then we have all these people who are hurting who are feeling alone and abandoned by the people who are supposedly caring for them and loving them. Um, so on our website, we've actually created a support toolbox. Oh, that's amazing. Um, 
Yeah. So we are, we've created resources to help give people a tangible way to interact. Um, in 2019, throughout the year, we're going to be releasing a bunch of new resources, which we're really, really excited about. Um, so right now it's just an empathy card that, um, has kind of like a watercolor version of our heart logo that says, I have no words, but I'm here for you. Mm, I love that. Cause I know so often we go to Publix or another, you know, grocery store or whatever to, to get a card. And I mean, some of them, I just want to burn them all. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm just like, these should not be in the hands of anybody. <laughs> like these are terrible, mm. <laughs> but, but, and, and obviously some of them are great, but I think, you know, our hope is that we can create a line of cards, one that speaks straight from the heart and are true and meaningful cards to give someone. Um, and two, we're going to create, um, a series of them so that you don't just send one card, but you send one every month for three months or six months or a year. Um, yes, especially so like you those keep showing up for someone. Yeah, because I have found so often in so many cases of grief is like people will show up right away. But it's mm -hmm. the people who remember six months, eight months, a year, two years down the road and say, I have not forgotten that that means the world. Yeah, more than anything. For sure. So so that's kind of our vision for the support toolbox is that, you know, we have a care card that's there and then we have a gift to session certificate um, for people in the states that we're serving. Um, so right now we're, we're currently serving the state of Georgia. Um, we've partnered with Northside Hospital. Um, we're working on some more partnerships this year, some more corporate sponsors um, to really enable us to you know, plant some deep roots in Georgia before spreading wide to the rest of the nation. Yeah, um, well, that's that kind of transitions to my my next question was, yeah, what is sort of on the horizon for you here in 2019 and in the future? Yeah. So the launch of new resources, um, we have a really, really cool project that hopefully we'll be releasing this spring. I'm really excited about it. Um, one thing we have a big fundraising event every year in Atlanta. And this year it's going to be March 1st at the King Plow Art Center, right downtown, um, or I guess midtown. But if that is something that you're interested in coming to, um, we would love to have anybody who's interested in supporting Love Not Lost to join us that night because awesome. it is a beautiful, beautiful night of meeting photographers and families we've served and connecting with our greater mission to really actually see what we were able to accomplish this past year. And we also share um, and, and give like a sneak peek of what's coming yeah. um, at the event. And so we have some cool things that we're releasing that night that we're really excited about. Um, and we have a new program that we're launching this year um, that is focused on grief training um, that will hopefully support companies and HR departments to help people feel better cared for and supported at work mm, through grief. That's big. Yeah. Um, cause people spend, you know, it's like half your life at your office yeah. and with the people you work with yeah. and it's like, okay, like I know some companies are like, no, they're not family, but it's like you spend almost as much, if not more time with them than your family. And so like they don't have to be your best friend but like they, it should be a healthy environment for people to do life together with. Mm, and so, yeah, so we have the, the grief training program that's launching. Um, and we have some new support tools that we'll put in our toolbox online. Um, we have the event March 1st. So again, we'd love to see you there. And then really we're just working on increasing our, our depth and services in Georgia and creating a city expansion plan for, um, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So it's really exciting. Um, and we can't wait to take this, you know, outside of 
Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for the listeners, as always, I will make sure to have Ashley's information along with the information for Love Not Lost. And so if you are listening and you are in Georgia and want to support this amazing organization, or if you live in another state and you want to see it come to your state and you're a photographer or something like that, um, you can go to their website, lovenotlost.org, and you can Mm -hmm. find all of that information there. Um, Well, Ashley, this has been at an absolute pleasure to have you on this show and thank you for sharing your story thank you for sharing the story of Skylar thank you for the way that you continue to uh just her legacy is outliving her and it is yeah. um having such an such an impact um so thank you so much um this is also the portion of the show where we transition a little bit to mm-hmm. just get to know you and ask some fun lighthearted <laughs> questions so the first question is what was your favorite tv show to watch growing up oh man i feel like I need a qualifier with like an age on this one (laughs) because I had different favorite shows. Like the first one that came into my mind was like, Hey dude. Oh, I loved Hey dude. Yes. I love Hey Hey dude. Dude. I was a big Nickelodeon kid. It's a little wild and a little strange. (laughs) Do you make your home out on the range? Stop yes. and was... come along. Sorry. <laughs> now now I've got the Hey Dude theme st- stuck in my head. <laughs> I was talking about it with someone the other day, and I, we, like, did this whole YouTube flashback journey. It was pretty great. That is hysterical. Um, what, isn't, um, wasn't uh, Christine... Yeah. Yeah, like, she's uh, uh, Ben Stiller's wife, and she yep. also is an actress. Yeah, she was on Hey Dude. Yep. I love yep. it. Melody. Yeah, Melody. Yes! Yeah. Oh, um... Ashley, you just took me back. <laughs> So yeah, I was a big Nickelodeon kid. Yes. Yes. I love it. Um, Okay. Question number two is if you had to eat the same meal for dinner every night for the rest of your life, what would it be? That's kind of a funny question because I, I know some people would be like totally grossed out and bored by that idea, but I kind of do that anyway. Oh, I I, I don't really eat the same thing every night, but I'm a creature of habit. And so I have like my go-to's. Um, my dad makes this killer dinner. He makes the best mashed potatoes in the whole wide world. Mm. And I know it sounds really silly, but they really are like everyone who eats them. They're just like, oh my gosh, they're amazing. My my husband Um, loves mashed potatoes. It's like one of his favorite foods. So yeah. So I would say the grilled chicken, he makes like this grilled chicken breast with mashed potatoes and like steamed broccoli and asparagus. Mm. Um, I probably cut out the asparagus because I wouldn't want smelly pee for the rest of my life. But (laughs) (laughs) but maybe broccoli. We'll stay with broccoli. Uh, I love it. That's hilarious. Um, What is a dream that you have yet to achieve? Mm. I would say seeing Love Not Lost to a national level. I love it. Um, Yeah. And and I think, you know, I, I Love Not Lost is about like 10 years behind Charity Water as far as like the timeline and stuff. Yeah. And I look at Charity Water as kind of like a big brother. Um, as far as like inspiration and just, you know, an example of an amazing organization who's doing things really well and really intentionally and honorably. And, um, yeah. So I think, um, getting to a national level, being able to share a story with the world and really, um, create impact like where it's felt you know, across the nation on like a big scale. That is awesome. Um, And my last question is, for what today are you most grateful? It's a really good question. Um, I am really grateful for my health. Seeing a lot of people posting about like sick kids or, you know, flu season and all of that. And I'm sitting here in a air cast because I broke my ankle two months ago. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, I was hiking in Idaho and it was worth it, (laughs) but, um, but it's, you know, it's, um, not healing as it should. And I had to get an MRI yesterday and it's easy to kind of like feel down about that. Cause it's like, it's been 10 weeks. Like I've been a whole month on crutches and then a whole month in the boot. And then I'm still in the boot, you know, it's like, uh, but I was thinking about it today and I was like, you know what? Like I can get around just fine in the boot. And like, I'm super grateful. I'm functioning. I don't have any other serious health issues that I know about. Um, you know, I don't have the flu. I'm 
very, very grateful for my health and my body's ability to heal. Yes. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show today and thank you for your time and thank you for your gifts and your talents. Uh, It is just, it's truly, truly an honor. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad we got to make this happen and thanks for having me. I'm so grateful for Ashley coming on the show and for being so candid about the loss of her daughter Skylar and how she fueled that pain into the creation of Love Not Lost, the impact that she is having on other families who are facing a terminal diagnosis, and the passion that she has for it is just incredible, and I'm so grateful. Be sure to check out the show notes for all of her information and how you can support Love Not Lost. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring amazing entrepreneurs and business owners who are changing the world with their businesses. And if you're a regular listener of the show, thank you for tuning in week in and week out. Thank you so much for your support. Please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, or wherever you listen to podcasts and click that subscribe or follow button. Clicking that button helps to make sure you never miss a new episode of the show. And if you wouldn't mind, would you head on over to iTunes and leave a review? Leaving a review really helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. And if you share the show on social media, you can use the hashtag Business with Purpose podcast or tag me at Still Being Molly on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. This show is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman, and the music is by Mark Killian of Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose. <laughs>